everyone. Welcome to episode 166 of the Book Cougars, two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. And we are going to rock your worlds today because we are doing something different. Yes, this is going to be an audiobook exclusive conversation. Yeah, we're really excited about it. At the end of this episode, we have a chat with Karen and Craig, who are the new co-hosts of a podcast for Libro FM. Yeah, as soon as we saw that they were starting a new podcast, we were like, oh, we have to talk with them because it's fun to talk with other podcasters. And then when Emily and I were talking about audiobooks, then after we talked with them, we thought, you know, it might be fun to have an episode all about audiobooks, at least audiobooks in our lives. Yeah, so here we are. We thought we'd first talk about Libro FM, which until this point, we've been referring to as Libro.FM. That's one of my big takeaways from talking with Karen and Craig. They refer to it as Libro FM. Yes, and we always put that dot in there, but you don't have to. We learned. So we're an affiliate of them, as longtime listeners know, which means we get a little affiliate money for every purchase that is made through our links. And then part of that also goes to the bookstore that you attach your account to. So they give back to bookstores, they give back to affiliates at no cost to you, which is the cool thing. And another cool thing that I think they talked about, right, that you can change your bookstore. It doesn't always have to be the same bookstore, or it can always be the same bookstore. Because, you know, as he said, they sometimes push bookstores that are doing you know, a special event or something like that. They're a really great company. It's been a wonderful thing for independent bookstores that used to feel kind of awkward about how do we recommend audiobooks? You know, how do we quote sell them? And this is a way that people who are audiobook consumers can still support their local independents. It's just been a wonderful business model. I'm so glad that they're here. I'm so glad they're growing and thriving and thrilled that we're affiliates yes. of theirs. So one thing to point out to people in our show notes, I've started to add if Chris and I are consuming a book via audiobook, I'm putting a link that will take you to Libro FM, just so you know, and that takes directly to our affiliate link. So perfect. Thank you for that the work done for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is con so convenient. I mean, just to have the links. Mm -hmm. Remember the old days before there were such thing as hyperlinks? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or digital audiobooks when it was, yeah, we'll get into all of this. <laughs> yes, we will. We thought we would take a little walk down memory lane about how audiobooks have changed, maybe, and all of that. First, we thought we would talk about just how we consume audiobooks, why we use them sometimes versus reading the paper or ebook version of a book. Chris, what's your favorite way to consume them? I'm usually driving when I'm listening. I don't drive a ton anymore, you know, um, but I love to listen to an audiobook when I'm driving. I have also, since the advent of earbuds, listened to them more when I'm cooking or doing chores around the house because it's so much more convenient. And it wasn't that great of a challenge to have a cord hanging out of my ears. You know, you'd get it snagged on things. And I just had no idea I would love ear pods as much as I do. So that's the main way. I do miss, in our old house, we had a treadmill. And that was awesome because I would end my work day by walking an hour on the treadmill with an audiobook or a podcast. Yeah. yeah. I don't like to walk outside too much listening to something. Now, that's my favorite way to listen to an audiobook. Partly, I like it when I'm both reading the print and listening to the audiobook. If I'm like, oh, I don't want to take a walk because I want to read, I can do both. <laughs> and I love that. I too like to do it while I'm driving. I love to listen to an audiobook. I particularly like long trips. You know, you can maybe even consume a whole story yes. in a trip. Yeah. That's my favorite thing. I also like to listen when I cook, but I don't use earbuds or my headphones. I use a portable speaker. And so sometimes, depending on what I'm doing, I realize, oh, I can't make pesto and listen to my audiobook because my food processor is just way too loud. <laughs> so that's sometimes a fail. But cleaning and listening, that I love to do because I don't love to clean. Yes, it makes it go by so much faster. And mm -hmm. I had thought I lost my earbuds yesterday. Mm -hmm. It was a big crisis in our home, I have to tell you. So I went to the library to pick up a book that was on hold. And it was such a gorgeous day. I thought, you know, I'm going to go for a walk. So I put the book in my car and 
got my earbuds out, got my audiobook going, and I went for a walk, came back to the car, took my earbuds out, put them somewhere. And then when I got home, I was like, where are my earbuds? Laura and I both looked in the car four times. Mm. She walked up and down the street, which I mean, unless they crawl out of the window right. by themselves. <laughs> but, um, you know, she was vigilant and I was so upset. But then today I found them. As soon as I sat down in the car, they were in a face mask. <laughs> oh, my. I was so happy to find them. I just started laughing that that's where they were, that I didn't pick up the face mask and oh, like right. shake it to see if it was underneath yeah. it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I'm so glad you found them. They're <laughs> very small and very easy to lose. I still use the old fashioned corded headphone which does get me caught when I'm cooking. When I do put my headphones in, I get caught on everything. So I don't do that very often. That's why I moved to the portable speaker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I can attest to Emily walking around, taking her walk with the earbuds <laughs> in. I, I see you quite often that way. Yes. And I try to be friendly to people, but really, I just want to listen to my book. Well, so. it seems like most people who go for walks in the neighborhood quite often have some kind of earbud happening. Yeah. Or they're having a conversation like yes. on the phone. Oh, yeah. And it's just, okay, not everyone needs to hear your conversation. Yeah. I don't want to know about Aunt Lindy's liver condition. I know. I So much privacy is, yes. is given away with these conversations. <laughs> I try not to listen, but I'm usually plugged in, so it works out okay. Now, do you remember your first audiobook experience? I don't. Do you? I do. Ooh. I really do. It was in 1993. I remember it because I was studying at the University of Nebraska. So I did a lot of driving between Lincoln, Nebraska in Chicago. And I was at the library. Somebody said something about it, a book on tape, because that's what it was. I was going to say they weren't audiobooks. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So I went to my library and or my old college library, and I browse the shelves. There weren't that many back then. So I saw a copy of Moby Dick, which was probably 10 inches thick because of the cassettes, and then the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I thought, oh, you know, I've heard of that. I've, I've never read it. I got in the car and I was going to start with Moby Dick. Have I told you this story before? No. All right, pop it in. And I hear the narrator say, call me Ishmael. And I thought, okay, <laughs> I cannot listen to that voice for seven and a half hours. I popped it out right away and uh, put the autobiography of Malcolm X in and loved it. I was riveted. When I had to stop for gas, which luckily I looked down to see that I needed gas, I ran and gassed up and made a pit stop as fast as I could, got back in and listened. I was that riveted to the story. It was like a blur. All of a sudden, boom, I was at my mom's house. Wow. Amazing. And I could have sworn for the longest time that it was James Earl Jones who was the narrator because I just remember this powerful voice. And I believe it was Joe Morton who was the narrator because it was the 1992 cassette edition. That's the year it was published. Wow. I do mm. remember cassettes too. It makes me realize how technology has changed and how much I utilize that mm. 15 second back thing. Yes. And with cassettes, you just couldn't do that. You could do the little rewind, right? right. You yeah. could go back, but you never knew how far. Right. And then also wear and tear. Those yes. things didn't yeah. last all that long if you did a lot of back and forth. But yeah, I remember that. I will always remember that audiobook. I do not think I really listened to books on tape. I think maybe I was busy raising my kids. I don't know. I just don't remember them. I remember people calling them books on tape. And I remember seeing them at the library. But I think I got started with CDs. And then I think we still called them books on tape, which I think is hilarious. Yes, we you did. Yeah, yeah, for the longest time. Yeah. Yeah. And then when all this digital stuff came out, I vividly remember my kids getting iPod minis, maybe. And then iTunes became a thing. And then suddenly there were these things called audiobooks. Yes. On iTunes that you could get. Yeah, it was revolutionary. Yeah. And I remember I was working at the bookstore at that time, and we sold a variety of different devices. I believe Sony had a player. And we also had different types of devices that would maybe play one audiobook at a time on a computer. So there was a lot of experimentation, but iTunes yeah. was able to produce it in a way that was most convenient for listeners. Yeah, and put it in on a small scale where you could put your music as well. I didn't ever get an iPod mini or iPod nano. 
I used to walk around with a Sony cassette player and take my walks. I had a little belt that it fit in. And I remember listening to books that way, mostly music. I don't think I got into listening to audiobooks on CD very much. I think I did a little bit, but I think once I could get them on my phone, that was a game changer. Yeah, absolutely. Because the CDs, CD ROMs, <laughs> you know, those were so expensive. Mm -hmm. They were really pricey 50 bucks for a book versus 15. $25 for a paperback or hardcover back then. And it was tough to carry them mm -hmm. as a bookstore because you never really had much of a, a market for them, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Yeah. It was really weird in the publishing industry because they didn't want to produce a lot of audiobooks because they thought that they competed with the paper book, so which is such a bizarre way to think of it now. But, yeah. you know, that's how technology comes in and some people can envision what it can be and others can't. They just see what they're losing from this other item. Right. But when audiobooks went digital, everyone got turned on to it in such an easier way. This is reminding me, I did listen to an interview with the gentleman who started Audible and then it ended up being sold to Amazon. I think it's on how I built this. It's a great interview because people thought he had lost his mind. I will look for that and put it in the show notes. Yeah, because why would you want to listen to something when you can read it? Right. Not thinking about how much time people spend in their cars commuting or on a bus or a train yeah. or people who would prefer to listen because of vision problems or just personal preferences. Yeah, I think he might have been a runner. Yeah. He wanted to listen to books. Very interesting. I mean, I'm thrilled that I have access the way that I do now. We both utilize different platforms to get and listen to our audiobooks. I've been using Hoopla lately. I use Libro FM. And on occasion, I use Audible. I'm going to talk about that later why I do it because I do try to stay away from anything Amazon if I can for books. What about you? What's your favorite way to listen? Definitely Libro FM. Mm -hmm. It was Audible before then. And then what was the platform that Ann and Michael used on Books on the Nightstand? Audiobooks.com. Audiobooks.com. Yeah. I was with them for the longest time. Mm -hmm. But then I realized Audible did have a much larger catalog at that time. But as soon as Libro FM came along, I was like, oh, yeah, this is something I can get behind for sure. I also do use Hoopla on occasion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because lately I've really been trying Russell's tactic of listening and reading. Mm -hmm. And it's been helping me a lot to focus like he talked about. So Hoopla seems to be a good source for that sometimes because sometimes I just want to dip in and listen to a chapter or two. I don't really want to listen to the whole book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the preview's not long enough mm -hmm. or doesn't necessarily start where you want to listen. And that's what I did yesterday when I picked up that book from the library. I went to see if there was an audio version available and there was. So I'm doing that too. I'm well, I'm not doing it at the same time at this point, listening and reading. But I did do some of that with warmth of other sons. Mm -hmm. Very helpful. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And you know, we've talked about it before too. The cool thing about audiobooks is when you're listening to a work in translation, or we've talked about it in terms of listening to books by indigenous authors where there are names that are not familiar to us to get the pronunciation. Yeah, as or a book with a lot of dialect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Puts you in the story a bit more. Yeah. As opposed to thinking, am I thinking about that word correctly? Back in the old days, you didn't really have a choice. You right. just, whatever the word was, that's how you were thinking about it in your head. And now obviously we can listen to the audio book or just Google it. Right. How do you pronounce X, yes. right? Yes, yeah. Chris, what are your favorite audio books? All right, okay. long time listeners, you know, I don't love choosing my favorites. We're trying to keep it to three. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, three. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Okay, so I already talked about the autobiography of Malcolm X as told to Alex Haley. So that was my first experience. And I do have three that I'll talk about. Oh, um, oh wait, see how she same? just snuck in four? Uh -huh. Oh, I see how you work. Okay. <laughs> keep going, please. So one of my favorite recent ones is Becoming by Michelle Obama. It's the first audio book that I listened to. And then I listened to it again within a couple months because I love the content so much and just her perspective and her sense of hope that she offers. And her voice. Her voice is great. Yeah. Yes. One of the things you said about Moby Dick, 
The one thing I will say about audiobooks is you definitely, no matter how great the story is, if the narrator's not doing it for you, mm-hmm. you can't. And I just felt her delivery of her own words was so beautiful. Yes, it was. It was just all down to earth. It felt completely natural. You felt like you were just sitting there with her and she's telling you her life. Yeah, with great compelling stories. Yes. Yeah, that's a good one. I loved that one too. Yeah. And admittedly, I didn't choose it because I was hoping you would. <laughs> <laughs> the first one that I thought of that was fiction, because I have to say, listen to nonfiction, was Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Bouly. And this was narrated by Isabella Starr LeBlanc. Ironically, Isabella Star LeBlanc is narrating Marcy Rendon's newest book, Sinister Graves. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Yeah, I just noticed that. And I think part of what I loved about this book was the story, which was really compelling. But also, I was doing a long drive. I was by myself. And as I was listening, I came to realize I was heading in the exact direction where this book took place which just made it super cool because I was going to visit my daughter for the first time in northern Michigan and the book takes place up in Michigan. And the narration was fantastic and the story was really good. Hmm. I think it's 15 hours or something. So it helped me with most of the drive, which was really long. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you know, I used to mainly listen to nonfiction as well. I had a hard time staying focused on fiction until... I was taking a certificate program up in Lake County, Illinois, and I lived in Cook County. And so that's north and south. And anytime you go north and south in the Chicagoland area, it sucks during rush hour because it's just traffic is so snarled. Not that it's not east-west, but it's just usually worse north-south for a variety of reasons. So I had to do that commute four days a week, and there was also construction So what would be like an hour drive under normal circumstances sometimes took me over three hours. Oh, my gracious. So I was like, okay, I have to do something before I explode and just pop like a overripe tomato in my car (laughs) because I would get so frustrated. So I tried some Patricia Cornwell novels. I'd read all of her stuff, and I really liked them. And so when I was looking at the library, what can I get? And these were CDs at the time. That's what I picked up. And I thought, oh, okay, this is cool, because I thought it's a story I know. So even if I wander off with my mind, I wouldn't be all that upset about it, trying to get back to the right spot to pick up the story. Those audiobooks got me through that experience, and I started looking forward to the drive, actually, because I would have that amount of time in the car, Yeah, which is great. And I do find if I'm going to listen to fiction, it helps if it's like a super compelling, plot-driven, something like that, great characters, that's more helpful to me than something that's super detailed. And even beautiful writing sometimes is hard to listen to because you want to stop and write it down. Right. Or even, (laughs) like you said, again, it goes back to the narrator. Mm -hmm. A narrator can put you to sleep Mm -hmm. in a bad way. That's (laughs) a very good point. Yeah. And I guess, too, that's another thing. Audiobook narration, they often call it performance now Mm -hmm. instead of just narrating it or just reading it. I think I've come across earlier recordings where they say read by. Mm -hmm. It's more than just being read by now. Yeah, it's a performance. Yeah. Speaking of which, I meant to say Firekeeper's Daughter, talking about Michelle Obama, the Obamas are going to produce it for Netflix. Very story. I think it's going to be a series. Not sure, but probably a series. Well, the uh, second book I'll talk about audio book is My Sister, the Serial Killer by Oyakan Brathwaite. This was only a four hour and 15 minute audiobook. I was looking for something short. I love this one so much. Talk about dialect pronunciation. My sister, the serial killer, Oya Khan, is from Nigeria, and I believe that's where it's set as well. So there is that factor as well that brought it to life more for me than if I was just reading it. But I know people who have read the book and loved it too, but that was fabulous. I listened to it every night when we had new sod put in after all this construction. And so I had to water the grass every other night for 15 minutes or something like that. So that's what I was listening to. It made that chore much more exciting. Yes. And, you know, I'm sure sometimes I probably overwatered because I didn't <laughs> want to stop listening. And then I realized, too, I got my sister a copy of the book for a <laughs> gift because I liked it so much. And then I thought... 
never did ask her what she thought about the <laughs> title. <laughs> But really enjoyed that one so much. It was a great audio book. And that's one I'd listen to again. You know, I started it and fell off it. And it's in my library, my audiobook library. I'll have to go back. Thank you for reminding me about that one. Well, my next favorite book was In Love by Amy Bloom. She narrates, which is part of what makes it such a beautiful book. I mean, I love her voice. And a reminder that she was on episode 153 talking about this book with us in our author spotlight segment. I think what I loved about it, memoirs in general, I feel like if you listen to the audiobook and the writer narrates, it just elevates the experience because if they're good, I should say, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Caveat. Um, not everyone should read their own book, I suppose. But you know, it elevates it because I just think they know where to put the stress on the sentence. To remind people it's about her experience with her husband, Brian, when he makes the choice to end his life because he has early onset Alzheimer's. And there were even parts of the book where you can tell she's getting a little choked up as she reads it. I just felt like the whole thing was very moving. I read the book twice and listened to it. So yeah, that was one of my favorites too. And I was banking on you putting it on your (laughs) list. So I love that one very much. How do you say it in poker? I'll trade you one Amy Bloom for one Michelle Obama. I don't know how to say it. I'm not a gambler. You can tell. (laughs) My last one that I'll talk about is True Grit. It's a novel by Charles Portis. It was narrated by Donna Tart, And I listened to this one because it was one of our read-along picks. It was our third read-along. That was way back in the day. Yeah. Yeah, that was a while ago. But Donna Tart did a fantastic performance with this novel. Her family has a deep intimacy with the novel to begin with. So she knows it inside and out because she's read it and listened to it many times. So her performance just knocked it out of the park. And you, you loved that book. Too. I love the book itself. Yeah. I mean, it's if, if you haven't read that one, listeners, I can't recommend it enough. It's about this kick ass young woman. What is she 12 or 13? She is one of my favorite characters in literature. And we talk about that book on episode 34. Oh, look at That's you. That's a little while that ago. That is a while ago. <laughs> and there are some books we've talked about, maybe even read along books that I don't remember all that well, but True Grit is so fresh in my mind. Mm-hmm. Well, we also watched the movie, right? We watched both movies. Yeah, there were two movie adaptations. Yeah. We had a True grit a <laughs> Yes. yes. <laughs> well, my next audiobook is Just Mercy, A Story of Justice and Redemption by Brian Stevenson. He's the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, and since we've read that book, he's helped to open the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. But we also made a biblio adventure out of this. Part of the impetus for us to read it was it was, I don't know what they call it again. Like Like one book, one Rhode Island, I think. Yeah. And so we read it, and then we went to Rhode Island. We got tickets to see him speak. We met Michael Kindness. I think I wrote down. Yeah, Yeah. I think Michael was there with his family, wasn't he? His mother-in-law. Yeah. Yeah. That was on episode 12. Wow. If anyone wants to go back and listen. I mean, I will never forget reading that book. He narrates, listening to his words. Such a compelling man. Such an important man in our world. I'm so glad he exists as a human being and is doing the work he's doing. Yeah. So that was memorable. That really was. I have such a vivid memory of listening to that one at our old house, standing in front of the kitchen sink, Mm. like just stopping what I was doing to listening what he was saying. Yeah. 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 It's that kind of a book. Well, speaking of listening to a book in a certain place and time, I'm just going to drop one more audio book that I really enjoyed. (laughs) Yes. It's my fourth. Chris did it too. Uh (laughs) And this is an audible original. And, you know, I struggle with this because Audible, we talked to an author recently that did a short story with Audible and we asked her, you know, what's your feeling about doing business with Amazon? And she said, you know, they pay really well and artists need to be paid for their work. So I get that, (laughs) you know, I really do. And Audible does a lot of original productions and they really do productions. I mean, they have built these studios where they bring in multiple narrators, actors, and they make productions. Yes. Some of them are really good. 
So I was doing a trip from Bend, Oregon, down to California. It was scary, icy, snowy. <laughs> And I was looking for something kind of short, and I found this. I actually think someone had recommended it. I don't remember who. And it's called Girls and Boys, and it's a play written by Dennis Kelly, and it was narrated by the actress Carrie Mulligan. And she had been in the Broadway. I don't know if it was Broadway. I know it was on the West End in London. I'm not sure if it was stateside. She had been in the production. It's a one-woman. Essentially, it's a monologue. And it was so compelling. I mean, it really helped me survive that very frightening <laughs> drive. So I think that sometimes when we listen to a book and the conditions we're listening to it in are memorable, mm -hmm. it really impacts your experience as yeah, well. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Laura and I have kept our Audible subscription too. And I used to listen to that kind of exclusively. And then she started listening to audiobooks and you can share an account, mm -hmm. but it got a little tricky for us. But then at that exact time, that's when Libro FM came along. And I was like, hey, Laura, why don't you just take over that? And I'll do all my audio book listening on Libro FM. So that's worked out really well. But I have listened to some of the Audible originals. And it is, it's really great content. You know, one of the problems with audio books and would say Kindle books is that they're proprietary. You can't share them. They're not sold on other platforms and things like that. So that's one of the problems with books and Amazon. Yeah. And I struggle with that because I don't think that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to do about it other than like you can't listen in to everything and read everything. So maybe at some point I need to make that decision and stop using Audible. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know either. My book purchasing goes all over the place and I do my best to shop local. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, especially when it comes to some obscure used book, they're the only place that has a copy available, yeah, you know, true. through a, a secondary seller. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Yes. <laughs> business. It's really, business. it's about business. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So what are you listening to now? I am currently listening to The Salt Path by Raynor Wynn. I was really excited to find a copy of this memoir at our local library book sale this past weekend. And so I am reading it and listening to it. And it's the story of Rainer Wynn's 630 mile trek on the Southwest coast in England with her husband after they've become homeless mm. in their fifties. Wow. Yeah. And it's narrated by her and she's doing a beautiful job. She has a wonderful accent. I love it. Wow. So they became homeless and decided to do this long walk. Yeah. Wow. It's a very compelling story. That must have given them a lot of time to converse and to think yeah. about what was going on in their lives. Indeed. And try to stay alive. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm listening to Sundown Towns, A Hidden Dimension of American Racism by James W. Lowen. He's the author of Lies My Teacher Told Me. I know a lot of listeners will be familiar with that book. This is narrated by Norman Dietz, D-I-E-T-Z. I just started it yesterday, so he has a kind of a lengthy introduction, and then uh, chapter one is what I'm into right now. So I also have the paper book. That's the one I checked out of the library yesterday, and I'm listening to it on Hoopla. Right on. Yeah. Oh, that's the other thing I wanted to mention, too, is with your library systems and hoopla which is associated with your library you can request them to get in audiobooks i do it all the time and hoopla i find is a lot faster at fulfilling a request than libby is mm. i don't know why but that seems to be the way it goes so yeah. now let's talk about speed mm. do you have a standard speed setting or do you adjust it accordingly to each specific book that you're into i adjust accordingly i usually start at one sometimes it's a fast talker mm -hmm. sometimes it's a slow talker and with accents like with the salt path i definitely had to get used to her accent before i could speed it up but i find that i adjust the speed if i'm just listening the speed is different than if i'm reading and listening because I guess I'm a fast reader. If I do one and a half, which is often my listening speed, it makes me crazy when I'm trying to read because it's too slow. Mm -hmm. 
What about you? Yeah, kind of the same. I usually always start with one just to see what the pacing is like, what the narrator's voice is like. And then I might bump it up to 1.2 or 3. Rarely do I go to 1.5. My attention gets a little drifty if they start sounding too much like hamsters. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> um, but I do know when I was doing the read and listen with the warmth of other songs, I sped it up mm -hmm. maybe to like 1, 6 or 7. Mm -hmm to read along without it being a painful reading experience yeah. to have it flow. Isn't that interesting? Same. Yeah. That's about it for me. One seven, I think mm -hmm. when I'm reading, of course it depends on the narrator. But yeah. Yeah. So we have an exciting upcoming buddy. Listen along. This is a first it, on the podcast. It is. This is <laughs> going to be our first time that we're actually listening to an audiobook intentionally with someone else and talking with them and possibly with the author as well. We're going to do a buddy listen with our mystery man, John Valeri, listening to The Fall Girl by Marsha Clark. It's narrated by both Marsha Clark and Kathy Lepard. So we've never done this before. We did, reminder, we did that Agatha Christie buddy read along with John, but we've not done a listen along. Right. It's going to be fun. Yeah. And I think that the other narrator is a friend of Marsha's. So I mm. think they kind of have a good time doing this together from what I understand. Right on. I can't wait yeah. to listen. I have it all queued up. We'll be talking to them in mid-October. Yeah. So if you want to listen along with us, and it is out in hardcover as well. We would love for you to join. Absolutely. Well, coming up next, we have a fantastic, well, well we think it's fantastic, <laughs> conversation with the hosts of the new Libro FM podcast. Yeah, they're only five or six episodes in, so get started. There's a really fun episode, I think it's the first one, where they talk to the founders of Libro, which is really interesting to hear. It was about an eight-year process of them talking to bookstores and figuring out how to develop this platform. And then there's another episode where they talk to different people who work for Libro FM about what they do when they listen to audiobooks. There's an interview with Emma Straub, the bookstore owner and author. So give them a listen. Happy, Happy reading. reading. Before we roll the interview with Karen and Craig, we want you to know that Libro FM has offered to do a giveaway subscription for one lucky listener. If you're subscribed to our newsletter, you're automatically entered to win. We're going to choose the winner on October 19th. And the giveaway is a three month subscription to Libro FM. So three months, three audiobooks. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. That'll give you a good taste of what they have to offer and checking out their app, which I think is super easy to use. 100%. Yeah. yeah. All right, good luck. Yeah, fingers crossed. We're talking today with two newcomers to the podcasting world, Karen Farmer and Craig Silva, co-hosts of Libro FM's new podcast. Longtime listeners know that we are proud affiliates of Libro FM. As soon as we heard the Libro team was starting a podcast, we wanted to get the inside scoop and meet the hosts. We're so happy to talk with you both today. Welcome, Karen and Craig. Hi, we're so glad to have you. And we thought we would start by asking yeah. you to just quickly introduce yourself so people can hear your voices. Tell us what you do at Libro and what your favorite genre is for book listening. As you mentioned, I'm Karen Farmer. I've been at Libro FM for about a year and a half now. And at Libro FM, I am responsible for customer experience, which is an awesome job. That means I get to talk to our customers and our bookseller partners, our bookstore owners every single day, just making sure that they're getting their questions answered. If they have any resources that they need uh, to be successful, I get those sent their way. My favorite genre to listen to in audiobook is probably memoir, which is kind of a recent thing for me. And I I don't know if this is necessarily pandemic related or not, but in the last couple of years, I've just been so fascinated hearing people speak autobiographically about their own lives. And I just cannot get enough memoir in my life. So I've, I've been gobbling <laughs> up those left and right. <laughs> I love memoir also. And I particularly like it if the folks are reading it themselves. That really adds a layer to the writing, I think. I yeah. totally agree. And one that jumps to mind when you said that was Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zahner. 
her narration is just absolutely incredible. And hearing the pronunciations of the dishes that she was describing and things like that was so, it it just was so rich. I think I listened to that one twice, actually. (laughs) (laughs) What about you, Craig? Yeah, so first off, thanks for having us here. We're excited to chat with you guys. My name is Craig. I've also been at Libro for about a year and a half or two-ish years. I am a product designer. So I work on the app design primarily for both iOS and Android. And then I've recently been, this is kind of under wraps, but we're doing a bit of a refresh to our website. So hopefully improving that experience a little bit for listeners. I also love when the authors narrate their own books for memoirs. I liked the uh, Jeanette McCurdy one that just came out. It was heart-wrenching and when she's talking about it, you can really hear it in her voice. So I think it makes a big difference. My favorite genre for audio specifically is definitely fantasy. Something about all the accents and how epic it is, especially if it's a full cast. I've talked with Karen before, but sometimes reading the paper version and the audio version going back and forth, I'm like, I'm just going to listen to the audio. It's so much better than when I read it in my own head. Yeah, right. So where do you listen to audio books the most? Oh, that's a great question. We, (laughs) Craig and I talk about this a lot, kind of for me, anywhere and everywhere. One of the things I love about audiobooks is that I feel like I can read twice as fast. So if I'm reading something in paper and I get to a point where I have to set it down, I'll cue it up to the same place really quickly (laughs) in the audiobook and then just continue on with my day and get to keep enjoying it. And so Not the most exciting answer, but chores, definitely a huge thing. I recently moved back to the Midwest, and so I have a yard for the first time in my life and find myself needing to do a lot of yard work, which I've (laughs) never done before. So mowing the grass and weeding. (laughs) I was going to say with mowing the grass, you must have very good headphones. Yes, the noise canceling is critical. (laughs) For me, I do not have a yard. I live here in Boston, so I love the CarPlay integration and it just helps the drive go, you know, if you're on like a four hour drive, you can just crush out half a book or something and it makes it go by a lot faster versus just staring at the road. So definitely a big audiobook in the car person. Agreed. I love to do that. As a matter of fact, sometimes you get somewhere and you're like, oh, did I even drive? (laughs) I don't remember. (laughs) (laughs) Probably not the safest thing. I've also listened to books that are so good that I get to the place and then I just sit in the parking lot for another 10 minutes. I just got to finish this chapter. Sorry. (laughs) You know, Target can wait. Yes. A hundred percent. As a matter of fact, I have a drive I do to my brother's, which is almost exactly eight hours, which fits pretty much a whole audiobook usually. But one time I pulled in and I wasn't done. I had like a chapter to go and I thought, oh God, I hope nobody sees me that I'm here yet because I really want to finish this book. Park around the block. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, really. I'm just going to go park at the grocery store down the street for a little bit. Why is she just sitting in the driveway? (laughs) One thing that I find so interesting about Libro FM is that it's a social purpose company. Can you guys talk a little bit about that? I'll leave that one to you, Karen. (laughs) Okay, perfect. (laughs) Yeah, so this is absolutely my favorite thing about the company and is is really the reason that I came to Libro FM. Because of our social purpose classification, this means that our company is allowed to make decisions that are not just profit-based, essentially. They can be made for the good of the community versus just the good of generating wealth within the small group of employees that work there. We do this in a variety of ways, but the most notable way I would say is that we split the profits of every purchase that is made on our website with independent bookstores. So anytime somebody comes and purchases an audiobook from us, they get to choose the bookstore they want to support. And immediately when that purchase is made, we log that and say, all right, this amount of money goes to that bookstore. So this can really contribute to the overall health of local bookstores over the course of time. One other thing that I'll shout out that I smile every time I talk about it, we have a relatively new program called Libro FM for Business. These are essentially very large purchases of audiobooks that a company will make. I'm making this up, but if you imagine that Google came to us and said, we want to buy 10,000 copies of a particular audiobook, we want all of our employees to read it, we could bulk sell that to them. And even with sales like that, those companies can choose a bookstore to support and that bookstore gets 10% of that massive purchase. So 
One of my colleagues and I jokingly refer to this as an Oprah moment. We have the very cool job of getting to call that bookstore and say, hey, this huge company just spent a ton of money. They picked you. You're about to get a massive check to do whatever you need in your bookstore. There's a bookstore partner of ours that it was one of the coolest conversations ever. Um, she has a brick and mortar store, but she wanted to start doing more of a mobile shop so that she could get out to communities farther out that didn't have local bookstores. And with that nomination from one of those purchases, she was actually able to start doing that. So there are many things that we do as an SPC, but I think that donation to a bookstore is so much at the the heart of what we do and always has been and, and will never go away. That's I, I love this. I'm like smiling so big. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's definitely one of the things we love about Libra FM is that you do give that cut to the bookstores because that's so important. And I know it was dicey for bookstores with other streaming services and having clients come in who need audiobooks. So to be able to now recommend audiobooks has to just be so refreshing for booksellers. Yes, absolutely agreed. One of the other things that's really interesting too that I've learned more about over time is just how cost prohibitive the earlier phases of audiobooks were. So when they were books on tape and when they were on CDs. I remember checking out those huge plastic clamshells of CDs from the library and carrying them around in my car and flipping through them while I was driving, which <laughs> probably <laughs> was not safe at all. But those were incredibly expensive and incredibly cost prohibitive for an individual to purchase. And so this digital model has just made it all so much more accessible to everyone, which is a huge improvement over the way that we used to be able to get our hands on audiobooks. Yeah, and raise your hand if you returned it to the library with the last CD still in your car. <laughs> <laughs> or cassettes. Absolutely guilty. Yeah, Dating or, myself. Yes. Cassettes. Myself. That's right. Cassettes. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Or had them out of order. That was always the worst. You're trying to change them in the car. And how did this get out of order? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's one of the things that audiobooks have come so far. And I know that the production have changed now. Craig, as you were saying, like there are casts now performing audiobooks, they're real performances, and it can elevate the reading experience so much. I know Chris was saying for bookstores, there was that tension between we know people love audiobooks, but there's not much skin in the game for us if we sell them audiobooks, and they're expensive, as you said. So this is such a great way that Libro FM has developed to share the wealth with independent bookstores who really still get people reading, whether they're reading audiobooks or reading the paper versions. Yeah. yeah. So glad. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a part that makes Libro different because there's a lot of websites and apps where you can get audiobooks, but I think that's actually a big thing that makes Libro really different is that a lot of our playlists are made by real human booksellers, right? They're not just like algorithms or whatever, right? And most of our book pages have little book reviews by actual booksellers. So it's a very similar experience to actually going to a bookstore versus if you went to the Amazon owned Audible. It's a very different type of experience, even though it sells a very identical product. No, that's really true. I love the little shelf talkers, whatever. What would be the version? I don't know what you call it for an audiobook. <laughs> that's but what, we that's don't the have, word I had yeah, in my yeah. mind. Too. Okay. Was, it's, our, it's our digital shelf talker, I guess. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's a yeah. good way of saying it. It's great. Well, the other thing that's really different about the company is that you're 100% remote. It didn't take a pandemic for your company to go remote. You've been doing it all along. What is it like to work for a fully remote company? <laughs> I've been remote fully since 2013. So I've worked at a variety of companies in that time, and all of them just happened to be remote. So I barely remember working in an office, but it's great. I rent this little office that I work in, and we have Zoom and all that stuff, but it is a little tough sometimes not to actually see the people and be with the people that you work with. But since the pandemic has not ended, unfortunately, but slightly more manageable, we actually have been meeting up in person here and there. I'll go to Seattle. We're all going out to Nashville in a little bit. So we are getting to do a little bit of a mix where we're mostly remote, but still getting to have that face-to-face -face communication and do stuff together. Like I think we did ax throwing and like, you know, like just whatever activity it is. So it is nice to like build those relationships, even if primarily you're remote. Yeah. I had a, a little bit of a different journey. I had never been remote before I started working here and I had always assumed that I would love it because I am not required to leave the house. I don't think I ever, <laughs> ever would. Um, 
So I assumed I would really like it. And I, I do let, I love working remotely. I think it certainly not for everyone in that you do have to work a little bit harder when it comes to collaborative projects, just to make sure that you're communicating really proactively, really clearly carving out time every day to have standups with your team and just check in and say hi and see how, how folks are doing. We do this thing, I think it's an app, I'm not sure, but it's called Donut. And every month it matches you with another coworker at the company and blocks off 30 minutes on your calendar to sit down and have a quote unquote donut or a cup of coffee <laughs> oh, um, just so to fun. like catch up. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I feel like I got to interact with some, even though we're a small team, there are some coworkers that I just, by nature of the work, I do work with a little bit less. So that's been really helpful. Unfortunately, there are still people I haven't met at the company because when we had this great meetup that Craig was talking about, I got COVID about three days before oh. it. So I wasn't going to mention how you weren't involved in the fun axe throwing activities, you know, oh. but, but yeah, was Karen was so the sad. one person not there. Aww. That seems like axe throwing as a team building seems like a novel to me. There could be some, there's one team member we've always wanted to take out. The murder mystery. Version. Here's, our, yeah. here's our chance. It can yes. be an accident. Ha, ha. Ooh, exactly. nice, nice. That's very, um, that's very Agatha Christie. I like that. Luckily, no Libro employees were harmed in the making of this team activity. How um, many disclosures did you have to sign before you walked through the door? We absolutely did. When we got there, we all had to sign stuff, especially since they also sell alcohol so you're oh, you know wow. you're drinking a you're drinking a rosé while throwing an axe so they wow. certainly make you sign your life away <laughs> that is funny i love it so you guys have 1700 bookstores as partners now that's amazing we really want the listeners to understand that when you start using libro fm if you're not doing so already there are a host of bookstores you can choose from. So you could even choose your local bookstore, a dream bookstore, anybody that's on the list to give yeah. a percentage of your purchases to, right? Yeah, and you can change it at any point. So if you want it to be your local bookstore for a couple months, but then you want to change it to your hometown bookstore or a bookstore that you heard of that maybe is in need, you can change it at any point. You're not locked into any bookstore and you can change it as often as you want. Yeah. That's yeah. a really good point. I see people do that a lot too when they give gifts, which is really fun around the holidays, especially, but also, you know, for people's birthdays or, you know, graduations and things like that. People will gift a bundle of credits to someone and say like, hey, congrats, here's six audiobooks that you can choose. So a lot of times people will switch it to the bookstore of the person that's getting the gift. My sister, for example, lives in Cincinnati and I know what her favorite bookstore is. So anytime I send her a gift, I really quick switch it so they get the benefit from it. So it's just a little extra special sparkly fun aspect to the gift, I think. That's so cool. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And I think it would be great too for author events. I'm hoping that streaming author events won't completely go away as the hopefully the pandemic recedes a little bit more. I know that the hosts of author events that are streamed, they miss that in-person bump that events can generate in a bookstore. Mm -hmm. So to have the option of getting that author's book through Libro, I think is just brilliant to help the bookstore and the host and you all. Yeah, it's yeah. a great idea. Yeah, definitely. I also hope they don't go away. There's sometimes an author I really love is doing events and they're doing a tour, but they just, for whatever reason, skip Boston. It's nice that I can pay five bucks and tune in if I'm really interested in the interview or the Q&A they're going to do. I agree. Oh, as much yeah. as I want the pandemic to go away, there's aspects of it that I hope stay. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not many. Right. Not many. right. <laughs> so wondering how it came to be that you have a Libro FM podcast, you are on episode six so far. I'm sure you have more in the works behind the scenes that haven't been published yet. But how did this all come to be? And how did you two get partnered up as the hosts? <laughs> oh, that is a um, great question. <laughs> I think the host thing was process of elimination. <laughs> think, Everybody does was anyone like, want to do this? Not no. it. <laughs> yeah. uh, it didn't have anything think, to do with axes. No, no, no. no. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I forget how we decided to do it. I know that it's been an idea that's been kind of floated around for years, to be honest. There's always been, should we have a podcast? And maybe there's no one to do it. And, you know, priorities because we're such a small team. So it kind of just comes up every once in a while. And this most recent time was, I don't know if like Karen and I like raised our hands. I mean, Karen's been podcasting for a long time on your own. So you kind of had the skill set already and I'm, I like to learn new things. So um. <laughs> thank you for the shout out, Craig. My sister and I also during the pandemic, we both love Nancy Drew. And so 
we started a podcast really just for fun for the two of us to we read a Nancy Drew book every episode and then discuss it. Craig makes it sound like I'm a very seasoned podcaster, but <laughs> I have really just recorded lots of information about Nancy Drew on computers. <laughs> Okay, so I was a Hardy Boy fan when I was a kid because my sister read Nancy Drew. I couldn't do what my sister did, obviously. But now <laughs> uh, this is incentive for me to read some Nancy Drew. I'm so glad that <laughs> you mentioned this other podcast, Craig. Yeah, see? <laughs> Getting you those followers. Yeah. What's, what's the name of it? It's called It's a Clue. We had temporarily stopped, but someone told the New York Times about us, which we did not see coming. It kind of blew our mind. And then all of these people started emailing us and saying, can you record more of these? It is shocking how many people still read these books and are interested in them. So we've recently picked back up the torch and we're, I think we're on book 35 now of 90 something. Are there that many? I didn't know. That's so cool. Wow. Yeah. We'll just keep going until we run out and then we'll roll over to Hardy Boys. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. That is so awesome. Wow. So your most recent episode was with Emma Straub, which was lovely. She's a great guest because she's both an author and a bookstore owner. So that was really interesting. And I thought it was interesting how she had a say in who got to narrate her last book. Yeah, Emma was great. She was definitely on our wish list from day one of doing the podcast, mostly because of the awesome author, also awesome bookstore owner. So it's prime person for a Libro podcast. She was great. And yeah, I find the whole world of who narrates books and how they get chosen and what that process is like so interesting because I knew nothing about it. And by doing the podcast, we've got to learn so much about it, especially on like the episode where we interviewed Julia Whalen and then also on the Emma Straub episode. It's so interesting to learn. Yeah. Ever changing as well. Yeah. And such a complex job, the narration aspect. I've always assumed that it was, but then hearing people talk about what that actually looks like day to day. I think it's something that's easy to take for granted. People are like, you sit down at your computer and you read out loud and then you're done. And just understanding the <laughs> the technology and editing out your own mistakes and getting sick of hearing your own voice. <laughs> um, it, I it can't imagine. grueling. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've learned even just with doing the podcast, how hard it is just to talk for an hour. You know, I go over to edit it afterwards. I'm like, oh my God, I said, um, 700 times. Yeah. I could not do it. There's no way. Our sound guy, usually we say to Pat, oh, this is the episode where I said, you know, 50 times. Sorry, <laughs> you're going to have to ep- edit that out 50 times. That's and- every episode <laughs> for me. <you> know, so. <laughs> I can only imagine some of these narrators, they do it for eight hours a day in this little foam booth. I can't imagine. Yeah. Yep. And then also Julia Whalen was talking to us about this when she does multiple voices per book. I have four different women in one chapter and they all have to sound slightly different. And then they come back multiple chapters later. And I have to remember exactly what they sounded like in chapter three. My huge admiration for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or when she's doing a book with another narrator who's in a different state and they're sending each other little voice memos of how they're going to read a character back and forth. It is intense. I think it is a... <laughs> It is a magical skill. Yes. Yeah. Somebody needs to make a documentary about that, the making yeah. of an audio book, because that would just be fascinating to see. That's a really good idea. Yeah. I would, I would absolutely, if that's a Kickstarter, you can take my money. I would 100% <laughs> want to watch this. You heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not a lot of my money. Like, you know, I would donate like $25 to this. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think it'd be really interesting because it would also be interesting to get the backstory of the narrators, you know, how they came to do this. And, you know, I just think it would be really fascinating. That's a good idea, Chris. All right. Something new to produce. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This documentary brought to you by Book Cougars. (laughs) So we did want to ask you both if you have a dream author, dream audiobook narrator that you're hoping to get on the podcast. I think I, oh, that's a great question. I... (laughs) So, so many. Someone who I absolutely love, I love um, short stories quite a bit. And George Saunders is just one of my absolute favorite writers of all time. I just love the magical realism that he weaves into everything and how odd his short stories are. I just think he's also very well spoken and seems to be a genuinely kind person who is interested in making the world a better place. So I would love to talk to him about his work. He's also a musician. So I feel like kind of what we're talking about with the sounds of things and how things resonate 
musically in your ear are really important to him. So he's on my short list. <laughs> I have two. Both are probably pretty unrealistic, sadly. But you said dream. So for me, it would definitely be Neil Gaiman because absolutely love his books and probably just if he wasn't an amazing author, he could just kill it as a narrator. I love when he narrates his books. And then second would be V.E. Schwab from the Darker Shade of Magic series, Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, because she's just probably my favorite author. Yeah, that Ooh, would be great. I've only read Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by her. I really did like it. Yeah. Julia Whalen. Yep. Yeah. Julia. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I have one other person that I'll mention too, and this is not someone who is an author as far as I know, but I'm just a huge fan of Liberty Hardy on Instagram. She just truly reads crates of books every year. And so she has just been such a good resource for me in terms of what am I going to read next? What should be in my ever-growing TBR pile? And so I just have so many questions about what her life is like reading multiple <laughs> books every day right? and you can in your mind. And I just can't imagine walking up to Liberty on the street and saying, can you recommend a book to me? How does she sift through all of that? Mm -hmm. in her mind? Yes. I read 10 today. So, uh. <laughs> so, I mean, this is weird, but I would like to watch her read a book. How does yes. she read a book? It just must be almost like a blur because she is such a fast reader and obviously a very efficient reader. Yes. Because she can speak so well about what she has read. Weird, but maybe <laughs> on my wish list. Watch Liberty Hardy read a book. <laughs> or, or see her brain yeah. scan or something. <laughs> I do think some people just can access different parts of their brain so that they remember. I'm interested in really engaged in a book when I'm reading it. But if you were to ask me tomorrow, what was the last book you finished? I would have to go to my Goodreads list and look. I'm not very good at yep. the recall of that. And some people, I think, just have really great access to that part of their brain. Yep. Yeah. I'm the exact same way. Even just now when you were like, who would be on your wish list? You probably saw me on my phone. I had to pull up in Libro and be like, who would be on my wish list? Rapidly scrolling before it got to my turn. Karen, please go first. <laughs> yeah, take your time. We're actually recording a podcast later today. And I had already read this author's big book not even a year ago. And I have to reread it. Yeah. I remember the gist of it, obviously, but not enough to sit for an hour and talk about it. Yeah. Be listening and reading it to prepare for this because like you, I can't retain everything. Yeah. I mean, maybe I have to admit, maybe some of that is the more we read, the more we're putting into our brains and we're overloading it. But Liberty's interesting. And I mean, I think you guys could certainly get her on. She was an early, early adopter of podcasting. And it seems like she would be interesting to talk to from that angle, if nothing else. That's a really good point. I love that podcast as well, specifically when she does backlist books. Mm -hmm. um, I found some really wonderful books through that that I had, had just never heard of before. So <laughs> Yeah. And that leads to a question about backlist with audiobooks. All of these books that were published before audiobooks were really a thing. Can you speak to that a little bit about how the company approaches that? One thing I think about a lot is things that are in the public domain. I believe those books are free for anyone to record and put out there. And I think we do have quite a few of those types of books that have been ingested into our system from Authors Republic. We also work with Find A Way mm -hmm. for a lot of self-published content that people put together. But I can tell you, you know, working in customer support, there are a lot of times when people reach out and say, hey, I'm looking for this book and I'll go try to track it down for them. And no one has ever recorded this. It mm -hmm. just actually does not exist in this format. So I kind of secretly hope that more people will become interested in picking up some of those public domain books and recording them. Not to beat a dead horse, but Nancy Drew is a great example of this. There are no Nancy Drew audiobooks out there. Oh, wow. So just for even like the sake of accessibility, I think it's really important for some of these things to receive the audiobook treatment. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Are you volunteering to record audiobooks for all the Nancy Drew books right now? <laughs> I am not. I am positive I do not have that skill set, but uh, thank you for the question, Craig. <laughs> I don't know. You and your sister could do it together. You know, you yeah. could just read multiple voices. I love it. <laughs> All right. We expect the first one in about a week. I can't wait Great. to listen to it. All right. I'll get, I'll get busy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, this has been so great to talk to the two of you. We're really excited to see a new literary focused podcast out there and one specifically from Libro FM, who's a leader in the audiobook world. So appreciate your company 
and what it's doing in the socially purposed realm, which I think all companies should be, but that's a podcast for another day. <laughs> so <laughs> glad that you work for a good company. Keep up the good work. Well, thank, thank you so, so much, much for having us. Yeah, this has been a blast. <laughs> Thanks for listening to The Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again in two weeks with another episode. Until then, come chat with us on social media. If you'd like to become a Patreon supporter, we would love to have you join our community. All of the books that we talked about in this episode are listed in the show notes, which you can find at bookcougars.com. Each book will link to our bookshop.org page where your purchase will help support not only the book cougars, but also independent bookstores everywhere. And if you're an audiobook listener, we do have a special offer from Libro.fm. You can find all of this information on our website. Again, that's bookcougars.com. Thanks, everybody. This episode is edited by Pat Keogh Sound Design.